as a church, we have been on a journey for the last two years to be a church that looks like heaven. And based upon our current condition in the world we live in, as your pastor, I've got a burden. And tonight, this message is more of what's happening in me right now and what God is doing in me. And so if you have a Bible or the Bible app on your mobile device, grab it and go uh, to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 1. And the Bible says there is a time for everything. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to tear down, a time to build, a time to mourn, a time to dance. And then in verse 8, it says there is a time to love. There is a time to love what God loves. For people who are in Christ, salvation is an expression of God's love. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, God demonstrated his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, while we were still sinning, Christ died for us. John 3 16, we all know that verse. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, he loved every person. That he gave his one and only son, that whosoever, an open invitation for anyone from anywhere who's done anything, believes in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his son Jesus as a reward for the devoted. No, sir. He sent Jesus as a random for those who were found in depravity. Love starts and ends with God. God is love. His nature is love. It's unconditional. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes verse 8, there's a time to love and a time to hate. What is the Bible talking about? What is God saying? Love what God loves and hate what God hates. And people are never part of the equation under any condition. Hate their actions, hate their sin, but nowhere in this book, nowhere in this book does God give us a license to hate people. Nowhere. Love what God loves and hate what God hates. And, and I get it, loving God sounds sexy. But, but could hating what God hates be the litmus, the litmus test to loving what God loves? I think I'll say that one more time. Loving God sounds sexy. It sounds, oh, that, that's so cool. But could hating what God hates be the litmus test to loving what God loves? Newsflash, we live in a church culture of salvation without regeneration. A church culture of faith without works, heaven without hell, a love for God without hating evil or sin. In other words, we live in a generation, a culture that says, I love God, yes I do, but I don't hate what God hates. Is that biblically possible? I really want you to let this question resonate in your heart. Resonate in your soul and mind today. Can you, can I love God and not hate what God hates? The Bible says there's a, a time to love and a time to hate. Now, God's love cannot be defined or described because God is love. Yet He calls us, He commands us to love our enemies. To pray for those who persecute us. The Bible tells us in Luke 6.32, If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. 
Think about it. Jesus called Judas his friend even though he knew Judas was going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. In fact, in Matthew, I, I think it's 26, around 50, Jesus looked at Judas and said, Friend, do what you came here to do. Now, that's love that you and I can't comprehend. And, and Judas was not a mindless zombie on this uncontrollable mission from God to betray Jesus. Did God know that Jesus was going to betray him? Absolutely. He's God. He knows everything. But he did not make him do it. Yes, God was sovereign over it, but Judas was responsible for it. God did not force Judas' hand. Judas made a conscious decision every step of the way. And he eventually chose to betray Jesus because he loved money more. And the Bible says it would have been better if Judas never lived. Judas kissed the door of heaven and ended up in hell. In other words, you can get really, really close to God and still not make it. You can get really, really, really close to God and, and still miss it. The Bible says in Psalms 97.10, You who love the Lord hate evil. What is the Bible saying? Don't play with evil. Don't entertain evil. Don't hang out with evil. Love God, hate evil. The Bible tells us in James chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, Do not waver. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from God. Their loyalty is divided, divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. God said in Ecclesiastes to love what God loves and to hate what he hates. In, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 17. It says, don't scheme against each other. Stop your love of telling lies that you swear is the truth. I hate all these things, says the Lord. And then the Bible says in Proverbs uh, chapter 6, verse 16 through 19, and, and I'm just reading the Bible. It says, there are six things the Lord hates. No, no, six is not enough. Seven completes it, completes it right? No, seven things that he detests. And it says, a uh, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a, fo a false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family. There's a, a lot of discord in the family of God right now. God says, I detest a proud look. I detest a lying tongue. I detest when you look down on people, when you humiliate people, when you act holier than thou, when you think you are better than other people, when you are guilty of sowing discord by attacking others over the same sin that you've committed. Our world has lost its moral compass. And the church has lost its backbone to stand up for the truth of God's word. When Jesus came to planet earth, he, he came full of truth and grace. A full measure of both. Grace without truth deceives people. And truth without grace destroys people. One without the other is dressed up religion. Yet God's grace, God's grace is inexhaustible. It covers a multitude, the Bible says. But it's not a license to sin. That theology is not found in this book. If someone's told you that, don't believe the lie. 
The gospel of God's grace is not just a pardon of our sin. It's also God's gift of power called the Holy Spirit of God to overcome the temptation of sin. True conversion will always result in conviction over our sin. The Bible says the prodigal son came home. The prodigal son came to his senses. I promise just believing in God or God is love is not good enough. It's not good enough. The Bible says the demons believe and tremble. I read an article the other day that said if you destroy an egg of a bald eagle, it's a $250 fine and six months up to one year in prison. That's crazy. But we can destroy an embryo, an unborn baby, and it's okay. And listen, this is not judgment or condemnation. Because if you've had an abortion, God's grace covers it. God loves you. He doesn't hate you. Over this past week, we have all witnessed hatred, violence, and death in its ugliest form. Am I shocked? Am I shocked that racism still exists in 2020? No, I'm not. Because we live in a broken world where evil is rampant. Where ungodly people do ungodly things. So I'm not shocked by the news. But I am grieved. I'm grieved that the church, God's people, remain divided because of the color of our skin. That grieves me. As God's people, we are called to unite, to come together, to come together against the injustices of this world. Yet the lines of division have dangerously deepened and the world we live in has become darker than a solar eclipse. How can we shine light when our ways as God's people look no different than the world? How can we be the light of the world when we're acting like the world? Jesus prayed for us to be one. He prayed for that. A unified church from every nation, tribe, people, and language. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation God's special possession how amazing is that and and this verse is not for us to go look at us no we are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation God's special possession because of him not us His special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. It's what God has done for us and through us and in us. Newsflash, the chosen race that Peter is writing about is not an ethnic group. It's the church. It's God's people. Our primary, our primary identity is not our nationality. It's not our gender. It's not our ethnic background or political party. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. And Jesus says to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And then he says, love your neighbor... As yourself. 
This is the gospel. Racism is the presence of hatred and the absence of love. And the root of injustice begins with scarcity, the the fear of deficiency. So what happens? We create systems so I can get mine first, which leads to greed and the idea that I have to have more. And it all leads to a selfish mentality. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. And when it's all about me, myself, and I, that creates biases. That creates prejudice, hate, and power. The power to control who's in and who's out. Creating a culture of cultural Christianity. Which is about one inch deep. Cultural and Christianity don't go together. It doesn't go together. Cultural Christianity says, I can be a biased Christian. I can be a greedy Christian. I can be a prejudiced Christian. I can be a Christian that hates black people, white people, brown people. I can be a Christian that hates cops, first responders, firemen, etc., etc., etc. That's what cultural, cultural Christianity teaches us. The Bible says to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then it says to love your neighbor as yourself. And so here's the question. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is the person next to you, in front of you, behind you. The person that you come in contact with next. They're at the grocery store. They're at your place of employment. They're at the gym. So here's the thought-provoking question again. I want you to download this into your heart and soul today. Can you love God and not hate what God hates? Can you? The church should be marked by crossing lines of color, socioeconomic status, and cultural diversity. We have to embrace diversity and lean into uncomfortable conversations. Why? To expose the lies and the racism in our own lives. Salvation is a beautiful thing, but sanctification hurts. It's a painful process of exposing the wickedness in our own hearts. And then repenting to one another and God. I promise you, diversity doesn't just happen. It has to be intentional. Because it's easier to drift towards people like us. People who look like us, talk like us, act like us. Racial reconciliation is not a social or skin issue. It's a sin issue. The Bible tells us in Galatians 3. And and right here in this chapter, there's so much racial tension going on. And Paul says in verse 28, there is no longer Jew or Gentile. Slave or free, male and female, for you are all one. Let that sink in. In who? Christ Jesus. Racism cannot be destroyed by silence. Abortion cannot be destroyed by silence. Sex trafficking cannot be destroyed by silence. The the ideology that all cops are racist is a lie. And it cannot be destroyed by silence. Bad people, evil people exist in all arenas. There's bad pastors. There's bad policemen. There's bad professors. You find them in every walk of life. Evil exists in all arenas and all colors. But it does not give us the right to be a racist or hate a group of people. The gospel compels us to speak out. The gospel compels us to be agents of change. Can you love God and not hate what God hates? Can you? Let's look at what the Bible says. 1 John 4.20 If someone says, I love God, 
but hates a Christian brother or sister. That person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? If someone says, I love God, yes, I do. I love God, how about you? But hates a Christian brother or sister is a liar. It's a liar. I didn't say it, God said it. I'm a real Christian. No, you're not. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? As Christians, we have to pull up the weeds of racism in our lives. The weeds of hate, the weeds of bigotry and prejudice of any kind. No race is superior to another race. We are all part of the human race. Following Jesus has a set price and it never goes on sale. Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow after me, he or she must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Laundry is the only thing that should be separated by color. I cannot tell you how many times this week my flesh wanted to sing, uh, uh, if you only had a brain. I can't tell you how many times I was thinking that while having a conversation with someone. It's time for some of God's people to stop patting themselves on their self-righteous backs and do some ruthless self-examination. Can I be honest? I'm a recovering legalist and racist. I really am. I can't tell you over these last two years how much God has shown how much I've been a racist in my own life. But thank God, He loves all sinners. People who has messed up. And here's the cool thing. When you become a Christ follower, those barriers come down and we become part of a new family in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Psalms 139, search me, God. How many of you are willing to do that in this room and online? Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. I've had some of those this week. Have you? Some anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Our only hope for lasting change starts with the church. And it's not a reactive plan. It's a redemptive plan of building friendships. Doing life with people that don't look like us. That don't talk like us. Posting strong words on on social media isn't enough. We must confess. We must forgive. We have to be peacemakers. All of us are made in the image of God. As a pastor, a teacher of God's word, the Bible says I will be judged more strictly. That's what it says. And so I take very serious what I teach from God's word. I have to teach the entire counsel of God's word. If it's in God's word, I have to talk about it. So please, whatever you do, don't pursue the microphone unless you are prepared to teach all of God's Word. Don't do it. Let that sink in. Don't pursue the microphone. Don't pursue the platform if you are not prepared to teach the entire counsel of God's Word. The Bible says the world will know that we are His followers... By our theology, by our church denomination, by church attendance, by the color of our skin, by our bank account. No, Jesus said the world will know that we are his followers if we love one another. The church should be a diverse, colorful band of trailblazers and trendsetters 
following Christ instead of our culture. That's who the church should be. The only way this church will look like heaven one day is if all of us are on the same page following God with every fiber of who we are in Christ. Because if we're not led by this book and the Holy Spirit of God, we're all in trouble. Over and over these past seven, ten days, I cannot tell you how many Zoom meetings and phone calls with pastors, white pastors, black pastors, who are feeling the anxiety of what do I say? How do I react? Many of them who have never talked about racial reconciliation. The Bible talks about it. So we have to talk about it. We have to get better. Starting with this pastor. And so I implore you, Journey family, if you are with us and if you are for us, for God's word, bottom line, then get on the journey with us. And let's take this county, this state, and this world for Jesus Christ. As we close, I am inviting my friend, my brother, Carlos Cabrera, to come up and close us in prayer tonight. Bro, I love you, man. Love you, too. Love you too. All right, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Holy Spirit. Be with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, Lord. Lord, you know our hearts, and you know that this day we're hurting, Lord. You know, Lord, that we all fall short of your glory, God. You know, God, that we need you today more than ever, Lord. This county, this city, this world, we need you, God. Father God, I pray that you help us unite and become one. Become one. Help us unite, Lord, and seek you with all our heart, God. Lord, you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the light. Lord, these days are tough on us, but without you, we will be overcome by them. But Lord, we take heart this day that you, Jesus, have overcome the world, God. And Lord, only your name will end racism. Only your name will end the lies of the enemy. Lord, united here, there are two or more gathered, and we know your presence is here, God. We ask you, Lord, and only you to guide us. Lead us in this day. Help us be the hands and the feet. Lord, help us be more like your son, Jesus, the one and only the one who can, the one who will, the beginning and the end. Lord, help us feed off your bread. We don't live on just bread. We live on every word that comes out of your mouth. God, we love you. We praise your righteous name. In Jesus' name, amen.